the Wagner Law Group. Thanks for joining our webinar today. The topic for today are some, uh, it's going to be some compliance issues for primarily for investment advisory firms, a little bit for some broker-dealer firms near the end. I titled this <laughs> kickoff for RIA firms, but actually maybe we should have called it halftime or third quarter because you know, the real kickoff might have been January 1. But we're in the middle of that first 90-day period where people are checking and checking their activities against their compliance dates. I thought this would be a good time to uh, weigh in on some of the hot items that should be getting your attention from a compliance or best practice point of view. So I have a few comments. So we'll go through a little checklist of some items for RIAs. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, Rule 3110 for, for broker-dealers. As I said before, this is really a, a mid-quarter navigation check. I realize that many of you are aware of some of these issues. You're working with your consulting firms. You have lists and emails and uh, webinar invitations. You have a lot of information around you. But I felt for our friends and our clients, this would be a good time to step back and measure. Where are we? Are we, co are we covering everything? Are we covering it appropriately? What do we really need to be doing as we swing through this first quarter, assuming that most people are on a 1231 fiscal year? And I think you'll see that a lot of it really relates back to uh, having the right policies and procedures in place, and that the thrust of where we're at now continues to go more toward more disclosure and, and more transparency on, on fees and services and, and relationships. That's what it's really all about and having an infrastructure of policies in place to, to get you there. And you really can't understand these specific requirements that need to be done on an annual basis or quarterly basis, I think, without having the context of where we stand right now in February of 2015 with um, current priorities, because I think that that helps us bring some focus to, to what's going on. So as most of you know, uh, let's talk about about fin well, let's talk about FINRA first. You know, back uh, back in January, they released their annual kind of regulatory and examination priorities letter. They talk about specific areas of concern, what they're focusing on. I think it's really helpful because that enables us to look at our current checklist, our policies and procedures to to gauge where we are. And and FINRA, like they have in the past, they start off by saying that the main challenges that they see in in compliance. Uh, and supervision problems or relate to you know an, an alignment of firm and customer interests, which is another way of saying putting the customer interest first. Which, by the way, is really interesting because that sounds like the fiduciary standard under the Advisors Act or or ERISA. I mean, that is, so that's kind of a backdoor way of maybe changing the standard or suggesting that it should be changed. Uh, standards of behavior, meaning the firm culture, supervision and control issues, how products are developed and sold and distributed and as always, managing conflicts, which ties into fees as well. I think that um, FINRA is really especially concerned right now on the retail side, the concern with senior investors. You need to think how that relates to your, your customer bases. Um, I think that they're, they're looking for a reading of firm policies to make sure that they really have a, a or they, they make clear that uh, Improper practices, regardless of whether the dollar damage is one dollar or millions of dollars, you know, regardless of how you measure it, uh, it just won't be tolerated. You know, this is what they, they call the broken window principle. It's broken; it needs to be fixed. Period. So, some of the areas where they are particularly involved in terms of focus, uh, in terms of sales practices, you know, they're looking at products and, and distribution. Things are getting more complex all the time, and uh, a lot of them are, are being changed to be more available to retail customers. And FINRA is really concerned that you know retail type investors investors uh, are subject to the right suitability analysis, and that the the reps, the financial advisors in the field, are properly trained and understand what they're what they're delivering. And there's all kinds of uh, new products out there. They've mentioned floating rate bank loan funds and and what have you. The big one in our world, you know, uh, in our ERISA world, of course, relates to the, the focus on IRA rollovers and other, quote, wealth events. Uh, we've talked about that before, and there's been a lot of discussion around that. So 
if IRA rollovers or capturing IRA rollovers is part of your business, you really need to be thinking about the intersection of ERISA, FINRA, Advisors Act guidance, and how it all works in terms of best practices. I think another related area is alternative products and alternative mutual funds. You know, is in effect they're trying to uh, the marketplace is bringing um, alternative investments. You know, fund to fund, hedge fund type opportunities out on the retail platform, and and the regulators are very concerned about how those are described and distributed fees and how they're ultimately understood. You know, at the client level, Finner as always is very focused on operations. You've heard a lot about cybersecurity and privacy issues recently in the press. That's really important to them. And just overall market integrity in terms of how the system works. So uh, those, those, are the, those are the areas of, of focus on, on the FINRA side, very similar to what we see on the SEC side. The SEC, uh, when they announced their priorities for 2015, they're talking about retail, you know, really focusing on protecting retail investors because they recognize that products are, are so complex or the bundling of services are so complex. You know, people have access to things now they didn't have access to 20 years ago. Um, fees, reverse churning, general sales practices, suitability, alternative investment companies, you know, registered mutual funds, if you will, but of an alternative ilk in terms of the method and the investment methodology. Those are areas that the SEC claims they're they're focused on some broader issues, you know, market-wide risks, and they have talked a lot about um, excessive trading activities and their use of analytics. They have access to so much data now; uh, it remains to be seen how they're actually going to use it and, and interpret it. But uh, that's something that they've talked about. They're also focused on um, on the private fund side, the hedge, what we would call the hedge fund world. You know fee, how fees and expenses are handled in there, and uh, they're taking. They're also continuing to look at uh, proxy advisory services. That's an interesting area because, in addition to the Advisors Act piece, there's also some specific guidance under ERISA back in uh, 2008, interpreted bullet dash 02, 08 dash 02. They updated prior guidance on the proxy. So those are things that areas that we know that FINRA and the SEC are are focused on. So let's let's go through our, our checklist and see uh, see what we can come up with here. I'm gonna I, as I said before, I realize that many of you are familiar with these general items. So this is more of a jog your memory, take inventory, see how you're progressing as compared to trying to explain every last detail about each of these items because there's a lot to think about. We're not going to do that within 30 minutes. I mean, clearly on the form ADV, that's a biggie. We we know you have your annual update requirement. Um, within 90 days after your fiscal, so March 31 is coming. That's why I say that we're, you know, uh, that, that this is kind of a kickoff or halfway through our our uh, our game plan here for 2015. And the fees are pretty are are pretty low on that. I think if you're uh, SEC advisors, uh, I think it's well, it it varies. You know, forty dollars. $150 for assets at, at some other levels, but very, very manageable. And you need to also remember to distinguish, you know, having your annual updating amendment and filing of that with um, material changes that are reported during the year because you have an ongoing obligation during the year on a more timely basis to um, update any, you know, certain items of information that become materially inaccurate. And, uh, Obviously, the brochure and the supplement have to be updated promptly uh, during you know during that during that time period. So you have to make a little gating factor in your mind. What do I need to do on an annual basis, and what do I need to be doing at the moment, if you will, during during the course of the year? Then you have, uh, in addition to the update, you have to think about the filing and delivery of AD, ADB Part Two. You know, all advisors that are SEC registered have to you know file an updated Part Two A annually. And uh, the Part 2B doesn't have to be filed, but it should be updated annually, maintained in your firm's files. They both have to be delivered to new and prospective clients before or at the time of entering into a contract. That's a little bit different than the ERISA standard, by the way, which talks about reasonably, reasonably in advance of entering into an arrangement. And then you also need to be thinking, for those of you that are exempt reporting advisors, uh, 
you know, if you're, you know, acting as an advisor to a venture capital fund or you have assets, you know, less than 150 million, it's kind of a different set of rules that will apply to you. So depending on your status, you need to kind of work through your obligations as to what you have to report when you have to report it. So make sure your your your, your tracking goes. It's also a good time of year to think about your state requirements. Um, you have uh, well, first of all, you know, you might not be an SEC registered, you might be a state registered uh, advisor, which opens up a whole new pathway for, of reporting, but also you need to be thinking about your uh, where you have a place of business or where your clients are. There could be notice filing fee obligations in those states. Some states only require an update, other dates require the filing of, you know, additional documents. So you need to really think through where your office is, where your IARs are located, where you, where your clients are, and see how that trickles down to your uh, your state requirements. I think also this is the time of year where it's really good to step back and look at your you know kind of take an annual review of of all your of all your policies. Um, you're required under the Advisors Act to you know maintain policies and procedures. And this seems to be a good time of year on a, on a variety of issues to, uh, to, be, to be addressing those. So some, some examples here that we can, that we can give you uh, maybe on the custody side. Um, you know, last year or the year before, the staff came out with a risk alert that they'd seen a lot of compliance deficiencies relating to the the custody rule, and you need to remember your, your custody requirements under 206.4-2. And um, there are four categories of custody rule deficiencies. First of all, a lot of people don't recognize they really have custody, failure to comply with the surprise exam requirements or with the qualified custodian requirements, or the uh, failure to comply with the audit approach for certain, for certain pooled investment vehicles. So that's an area that you need to be looking at. Yeah, you know, just generally compliance procedures, as I said before, um, it's a good time to train your people, certify compliance with everything, um, note any new participation or withdrawal in certain activities by the company, you know, legal changes and other developments. Social media, which I've spoken on before at some other webinars, is really important. The SEC is suggesting that SEC advisors adopt and review, you know, kind of the effectiveness of whatever policies and procedures they have regarding social media. It has to comply with the anti-fraud provisions of the securities law as well as the uh, general compliance and record keeping provisions of the Advisors Act. The SEC has been reviewing some advisors in this area. There's been a risk alert out in the past with observations and it's an area to really stay on top of. It's a good time to check on your code of ethics. You're, you're required code of ethics uh, for SEC registered and um, that would include not only your fiduciary duties but your process and procedures for restrictions on insider training. You should really review these annually for their sufficiency and, and kind of measure them against your current business practices. Privacy. I think you know you have annual requirements there. Uh, as I mentioned before, the things happening on the on the proxy side uh, that also have an ERISA counterpoint, anti-money laundering. I think that on the on the form PF. Uh, this is the time of year that you need to check your filings form D if there's any private offerings. Um, the the thing about the form PF is that you have to file an updated uh, form PF within 120 days of your fiscal year end. So that's coming up. Uh, the rules vary a little bit if you're an advisor to larger hedge or liquidity funds, and there might be quarterly filings involved uh, within within 60 days or 50 days of the quarter end. That's something to think about. And as I said before, fund end really relates to. Uh, you know, ongoing offerings that you might be running through your through your firm. It's also the time that you need to be thinking about uh, various schedules. 13G and D and Section 16 filings were already 
already do last week. And, uh, you know, those of you with investment discretion over funds that are beneficial owners of 5% or more of a registered voting equity security have to report your positions. You also had 13F filings that were due. Um, and that's a different standard that involves discretion with regard to $100 million or more. Then you have some mega, mega large trading thresholds, Section 13H. Those things are all slightly past us now, but uh, I assume that you've been on, on track for those. I mentioned uh, privacy, you know, Reg SP. You should really be distributing those annually, even if no changes, just as a matter of uh, best practice and compliance with the requirements. Now, some of you listening today might also be commodity pool operators or commodity in the commodity trade business. You either might be operating as such or eligible for an exemption. But either way, this is the time of year we need to be thinking about updating your filings. If you're relying on an exemption, uh, you know, pursuant to the de minimis exemption, you have to reaffirm that uh, exemption with the uh, National Futures Association uh, very soon, within 60 days at the end of the calendar year. And there's some special rules, for example, depending on other states, like here in California, uh, there's a March 31 cutoff for advisors that are eligible for exemption with, with uh, the California Department of, Department of Corporations. So there's also some, you know, if you're involved in any HSR filings or foreign bank account reporting, uh, this is the time of year to be checking your your, your status on those on those items. I think I mentioned private fund offering documents a moment ago. Uh, you know, any the offering documents for any private fund, you know, ought to be updated annually to reflect changes in in business or operations or you know personnel or or performance. So I think it's a good practice just to kind of look at your standard offering documents once a year and update them for all these things. See if if there's any new affiliated persons under the Forty Act, the Investment Company Act, that might have come in see if you're still measuring up against the exemptions, and so on. You also have a Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act compliance. It's that time of year to think about um, your withholding. The, you know, that was back in 2010. They introduced a 30% withholding on payments to non-US entities. So you need to be thinking about if, you have, if there's any payments to foreign financial institutions you're subject to withholding, unless uh, there's an agreement with the IRS uh, to determine where the entity has any direct or indirect account holders. And you also have to think about payments to non-financial foreign entities that's subject to withholding as well, unless there's certain certifications involved. Pretty complex area. The, the regs were just updated this last year uh, under, from the IRS. And I guess the question is whether offshore funds will be treated as foreign financial institutions and how all the rules are going to work. Uh, if you are a custodian of assets, there's an annual audit requirement, as I mentioned before, and uh, you have to you may have to contract with an independent public accountant for a surprise audit to verify these assets. If you're an advisor to hedge funds or, or uh, pooled investment vehicles, you know you might be exempt from the annual requirements if financial statements, uh, gap statements are available uh, and delivered to investors. So again, that's a whole pathway of items that you should be thinking about. Insurance, good time of year to check your E&O policy, any special riders for a risk of fiduciary, any special bonding requirements you might have. And just generally speaking, I think, you know, if you're if you're in, if you're involved in advising any kind of plan assets or a fund with benefit plan investors, you really need to know whether, you know, what your status is. You should be doing that on an ongoing basis anyway in terms of, you know, investment or or withdrawal because that test is ongoing each day of the year. But um, I think that, you know, the 25% issue becomes a, a uh, significant measuring point for people in the private fund world anyway. And then you have all the host of other ERISA requirements in terms of disclosures, 5,500 reporting, satisfying or maintaining compliance with any uh, QPAM or prohibited transaction exemptions you're operating under. There's a lot, lot to go on there, for sure. 
cybersecurity has been in the news quite a bit lately. I know you've all been hearing about it. Uh, the SEC and FINRA are really on the alert and have released risk alerts, no pun intended there, uh, for information about uh, what they were seeing in the in the broker dealer and investment advisor world of preparedness. And I think they're looking at uh, kind of how you're governing this issue and the identification and assessment of risks, the protection of networks, uh, what happens if you have remote customer access, people transfer funds, vendors or third parties that have access to your network, so on and so forth. So there's a pretty good list of sample questions. There's a lot of material available on the SEC website and the FINRA website about how to stay up on this, and uh, it's an area that definitely merits some, some attention. I think that uh, so, so those, those are some of the areas that are coming up on an annual basis for you to be thinking about in terms of your uh, compliance under the Advisors Act and related issues. I think most of them really get back to complying with a specific statute or regulation. That's kind of transactional. And you have an underlying more of a policy compliance issue, which is do you have written procedures in place, written policies in place that will assure uh, compliance with these objectives. And, and you have to measure that also against industry best practices. Right? So I think what we're seeing is that people have an awareness, you know, our clients, uh, advisors, and broker dealers have general awareness of all these issues. But um, when the examiners are in and they're looking at the written process and procedures that they're not always as formalized or thought out or developed as they really need to be. So we know that it's an area of ongoing inquiry. So in all these topics that I've talked about, having a good procedural backdrop is really what it's all about. And that will defend you and support you and help you deliver better products and better services to those clients, be they retail or, institu or institutional, who are, who are uh, you know, being protected, if you will, by these regulators. The other thing I wanted to mention today uh, quickly is uh, Rule 3110. This is a little bit more for our broker-dealer clients. It, 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 it's pretty significant change. It became effective this past December 1, so now we're two or three months into it. Just wanted to remind you some of the key areas and kind of ask you to ask yourselves, have you done everything you're supposed to do to be in compliance? Um, the, you know, FINRA has these consolidated rules, supervision rules came into place, and I think that one of the differences between the way the rules have been consolidated and became effective this last December 1 and, and where they were previously is that in the current set of rules, I think FINRA is more assertive and it's bolder, if you will, in terms of what it presumes or expects uh, an effective uh, supervision structure to look like, particularly in the conflicts area. In the past, they said you have to avoid conflicts, but they kind of left it to the to the member firm to figure out how to do it. I think they're getting more assertive and more presumptive as to, as to what things should look like. And they've also made it quite clear that uh, there needs to be a, uh, a good set of compliance and systems and written systems in place, and uh, that the conflict in this area, you know, really, really needs to be to be avoided in, in the supervisory system. Some of the key areas, you know, they've talked about the the impact of the conflicts of interest on on supervision, and they talk about uh, two common conflicts that might in, that might adversely affect, you know, a firm structure. First, they talk about uh, the requirement that a firm have procedures that prohibit associated persons to perform a supervisory function from supervising their own activities and reporting to or having their compensation or employment determined by the person they're supervising. That kind of makes sense. And then they also are requiring that firms have procedures to prevent a firm's supervisory system from being, you know, compromised by an associated person's position at the firm, you know, the revenue they generate for the firm or any compensation the associated person. Uh, conducting the supervision might derive from the associated person being supervised. So this is like a, like a manager paid overtime on commissions earned by a representative he supervises, that sort of thing. A lot of work on OSJ, 
it was going to have people rethink how they've established OSJ and how they supervise them. That's something you should be aware of in your practices. The consolidated rules, uh, they pertain to the requirement that a firm inspect its branch offices on the same cycles as the current rule. Um, and, but they've embellished that a little bit in terms of non-branch locations. There's going to be uh, a need to have supervisory procedures in place that specifically include procedures to deal with all written and electronic. That includes electronic, I should say, customer complaints. That, uh, that used to be an old New York Stock Exchange rule. Now, I think now it applies everywhere. And just some updated rules on reviewing transactions. Um, for example, a registered uh, principal has to now show has to show in writing a review of all the transactions related to the investment bank and securities business. So these are the these are some of the areas that come out in Rule 3110 that are in place now. And in terms of exam, you know, the, the, I think the SEC and and Friend have, have announced that for companies that have never been audited before, that's a real high goal to make sure that anyone who can say they've never been audited will no longer be able to say that. So especially if you're a newer firm and have yet, you've yet to have an audit of, you know, from the SEC or had any FINRA examiners in your, in your office, I think they'll be looking specifically for this supervisory structure to be in place. So it's good that you are paying attention to it. These rules are going to hit firms that are large and small. No one is able to escape having to deal with these new requirements for supervision. FINRA clearly expects to see more documentation. Uh, which supports why they do or don't do something uh, in a certain way to achieve compliance, particularly if it's different from those kind of presumptions that I talked about earlier on that are built into the rules. So I think it's a great time to kind of revisit your procedures on all the topics that are covered at 3110 and 3120 and uh, be prepared to march forward. That was fast. That seemed like a lot in 27 minutes. I hope it was a good checklist for you and that it just has you thinking about areas where you're involved, what you're doing, have you updated them, are you current, are, th are your procedures and your Form ADVs and all your client documentation consistent, that sort of thing. So I hope that was helpful to you. To a couple of webinars coming up in March, I'm going to do one with my a colleague in our Boston office, our partner in charge of our employment practice, David Gabor, as some of you might know. We're going to be doing some of the employment law and tax law impacts on uh, independent contractors, leased employees, because that's still a huge area for IRS and state level tax authorities to be examining. It'd be a good reminder for everyone. And, and my next regularly scheduled investment management webinar uh, will be on March 26th. We'll be sending you information on that shortly. So thank you very much for attending. Please make sure you let us know if we can help you in any way or if you have any questions, and we will respond. Thank you very much and have a great day.